Okay, for the next topic, for the unit 4 plant life processes will be the respiration. So under 4, respiration is glycolysis. As we all know that plants are living things, this means that they perform the process of respiration by taking in oxygen and giving out CO2. Plants do not have any organs for breathing. The exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in plants takes place through small pores called stomata. These stomata are present under the surface of leaves. Stomata are responsible for the exchange of gases for both processes of respiration and photosynthesis. Stomata along with nearby guard cells are known as stomatal apparatus. Expansion and contraction of guard cells which is caused by moisture and light is responsible for the opening and closing of the stomata. Hence, the guard cells are responsible for the opening and closing of a stomata. The rate of oxygen used during respiration is much less than that produced during photosynthesis. Now we will talk about the two main ways by which plants respire. First of all, we will talk about root respiration. Root cells of plants also need oxygen to generate energy. But do you know from where do the roots of plants get oxygen from. They get this oxygen from air trapped between the soil particles. And that is the reason why we should not overwater potted plants. Cause the water replaces the air in the soil and the roots cannot breathe. This affects the growth of plants. Now mangrove trees growing in swampy areas cannot get air from soil as it is waterlogged so they have aerated roots to take in air and now we know that photosynthesis and respiration takes place together during the day and now i may tell you that how these processes takes place together in a plant during the day photosynthesis and respiration takes place together since photosynthesis is the major activity, more oxygen is released during photosynthesis than is absorbed during respiration. Therefore, there is a net absorption of carbon dioxide and release of oxygen by plants during the day. However, photosynthesis does not occur at night. Only respiration takes place, which means that plants take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide at night. Glycolysis is the start of a pathway that evolved to get free energy out of glucose. As we move through the glycolytic pathway, we'll do some real life energetics problems. We'll try to understand the concept of coupled reactions and the role of substrate level phosphorylation in the production of ATP. We're also going to see that there is some investment of free energy, some investment of or consumption of ATP that is necessary to get glycolysis underway, to get it started. When we study the enzymes of glycolysis, we'll also look at the logic of allosteric regulation of this pathway and the implications of biologically irreversible reactions. Okay, the end game of glycolysis, and in fact of respiration, is to get free energy out of glucose and into ATP. And here is a drawing of the ATP molecule as it would exist at about pH 7, where it is most of the time in cells. ATP is the energy currency of life. Its phosphoanhydride linkages release a lot of free energy when hydrolyzed which is why we usually call ATP a high energy phosphate compound and we call the phosphoanhydride linkages high energy bonds. The water addition is made easier because the phosphates are very electronegative creating an effect of repulsion between the phosphates. The hydrolysis of the beta gamma and of the alpha beta phosphate linkages release considerable free energy that can be used to do different kinds of cellular work. To understand how this free energy rich ATP molecule is made, first you may remember that photosynthetic organisms from cyanobacteria to green algae all the way up to higher plants capture the free energy of light in chemical nutrients, mainly glucose. All organisms get nutrient free energy either by fermentation or respiration, putting this free energy into high energy intermediates like ATP. Then the ATP itself is hydrolyzed in many cellular reactions to harness its free energy to do cellular work for growth or other free energy requiring metabolism. 
Now let's recall just how much free energy is available from ATP. ATP hydrolysis is very exergonic. The standard free energy change, delta G0, is equal to minus 7.3 kilocalories per mole of ATP hydrolyzed. The dehydration synthesis of ATP is therefore highly endergonic to the tune of plus 7.3 kilocalories per mole. The free energy needed to do this reaction comes from the fermentation or respiration of nutrient molecules like glucose. Here again is the chemical equation for the combustion of glucose. In cells this occurs in three steps, the principal pathways of glycolysis, the Krebs or TCA cycle, and electron transport. This releases 686 kilocalories per mole of glucose oxidized. The free energy released in these three pathways is captured in ATP either by substrate level or oxidative phosphorylation. The amount of this 686 kilocalories per mole available from glucose that is actually captured as ATP is about 263 kilocalories. Okay, here is an overview of glycolysis. Glucose, or G here, is delivered to cells where membrane proteins called glucose transporters facilitate their diffusion into the cell. In stage one of glycolysis, glucose is phosphorylated, then isomerized to fructose phosphate, and then phosphorylated a second time to make fructose diphosphate. This is stage one of glycolysis, in which, as you can see, two molecules of ATP have been consumed, and a six-carbon sugar has been split into two three-carbon sugars. Here is stage two of glycolysis. Note that each of the reactions in stage two happens twice per starting glucose molecule and yields in the end two molecules of pyruvate or pyruvic acid. The first reaction of the second stage is an oxidation or a redox reaction involving the oxidation of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate or G3P. In two subsequent reactions, ATP will be made by substrate level phosphorylation. Because these reactions occur twice, a total of four ATP molecules will be made by the time pyruvate is produced. To summarize then, in stage two, there's been a redox reaction, in fact, an oxidation of carbohydrate, and a synthesis of two molecules of ATP. Again, each reaction occurring twice per starting molecule of glucose. Well, there are two alternative fates for pyruvic acid. In anaerobes, or in cells under anaerobic conditions, pyruvate can be reduced to generate one of several fermentation end products. Two well-known ones are ethanol and lactic acid. At the end of a fermentation, there will have been several redox reactions, but in fact no net oxidation of carbohydrate. On the other hand, in aerobic organisms, or in cells under aerobic conditions, pyruvate will be completely oxidized to carbon dioxide and water by respiration in mitochondria.